if we look at the world today, how can we ensure that the beautiful parts of nature remain a big part of our lives as human beings in, in the way we think about it, in the way we also keep it around, preserve it, you know, we keep it part of our minds and part of our world. It's a very difficult question because every time there is a conflict between conservation of a natural habitat and allowing people to get that little bit of extra food for their babies, then naturally the tendency is for the humans to win. And so we have this steady erosion in the face of tremendous efforts to conserve nature. We have a continuing steady erosion of habitats and all the species. And the numbers are always in the wrong direction. Occasionally, you get sort of wonderful little examples of something being saved, but uh, the overall trend is clear. And it's very difficult to see how one can ever escape that because uh, it's not human. Uh, now that we are essentially a single tribe, to uh, want to save an elephant if it means killing 20 humans. So I think the only way in which we can uh, really conserve is if we uh, put tremendous effort into conserving the very best representative areas of nature. Often this will be the national parks that already exist. And what we have to do is to make them so valuable that it actually it is worth it in terms of human survival to be able to keep those sorts of places. And you know that's the attitude that uh, uh, my colleagues and I have taken in Uganda, where uh, we want to uh, keep the Kibale National Park alive, which has got the largest population of chimpanzees in Uganda, and it's got elephants and wonderful birds and wonderful butterflies and wonderful plants and so on, and um, and visitors, and lots and lots of visitors. It may be that we're going to have to have huge increases in the amount of charges that you pay for ecotourism. And you need to make sure that ecotourism is done right. Mm -hmm. In other places, you will uh, keep nature there because it's useful for um, maintaining the climate, uh, you know, bringing rain. Uh, maybe uh, you can, in some places, uh, convince people of the sheer sort of aesthetics of keeping nature that even over the long term, presidents whose job it is uh, to look for the future of the country will be persuaded that you can do it for purely aesthetic reasons. But overall, um, what is required is for people in the rich countries to do much more investment than uh, they have so far in maintaining both the natural places in their own countries and in the tropics. And if you look at Africa, you know, I mean, the population trends are that Nigeria um, may become the most populous country uh, in the world, I think, uh, within a century. Mm -hmm. uh, the future of African habitats, you know, it's clear what's going to happen in general there's going to be a huge conversion towards agricultural land. Uh, I heard Ed Wilson speak years ago about the prospect of uh, the entire globe being turned into a single human feedlot. It's going to take a lot to avoid that. He is out there calling for uh, half the earth to be devoted to nature. It's incredibly ambitious and incredibly optimistic. But unless you have really exciting goals, probably nothing will be achieved. Yeah, I mean, there's something um, to me, like when I visit New York and I see Central Park and then somehow we constructed a situation where you preserve this park in the middle, probably some of the most expensive land in the world. The fact that that's possible gives me hope that you can do this kind of preservation at a global scale. 
uh, perhaps for just the aesthetic reasons of just valuing the beauty and um, just respecting our origins of having come from the earth. We are so incredibly lucky to have chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas as our um, close relatives still living on the earth. You know, we're unlucky that we don't have Australopithecines and other species of Homo, but we're still lucky to have those because they are incredibly closely related to us compared to what most animals have. You know, there are many animals that don't have any close relatives uh, to them on the earth. But not only are they, they relatively close, but they teach us so much about ourselves. You know, they the similarities between them and ourselves raise questions that we can then test about the extent to which our own behavioral propensities are derived from the same evolutionary stock as in those great apes. Well, how much is that worth? You know, I mean, we could spend billions going to the Mars to find evidence of bacteria there, and that's fascinating too. Mm -hmm. But we should be spending billions on this Earth in order to make sure that we have I don't know how to say it, you know, substantial representative populations mm -hmm. of these close relatives. Yeah, that we can meet. There's something um, like space tourism, when you go out into space and you look back down on Earth, that's to a lot of people, including myself, is worth a lot. But why is that worth a lot? Is because you, uh, it's humbling and beautiful in the same way that meeting our close evolutionary relatives is humbling and beautiful. Just to know that this, this is what we come from. This is who we are. Not just for the understanding or the science of it, but just like something about just the beauty of witnessing this. Um, and it's again, it's both humbling and empowering that this place is fragile and we're damn lucky to be here. Yes, yeah. and unfortunately, the problems are incredibly difficult to solve, and there is no one solver. You know, it has to ha happen from a network of of potentially cooperating people. But, but I mean, you're so right about it being daunting to to think about what it it looks like from space. And I love the view that Herman Muller expressed of uh, of being able to go out from space. And he said the whole of life uh, would look like a kind of rust on the planet. Mm 